hear me? So uh, welcome back again. Uh, those of you who weren't here last week, my name is Ethan L.G. Keene. I'm one of the uh, instructors here, presenters at OCIA. And you'll see me in and out throughout the year. Uh, you won't get a break from hearing my voice all the time. Well, the others that come in, which will be, I'm sure, to your great joy and excitement. So, uh, we can kill the lights in the back, I might can see a little bit better. So, if, uh, if I asked you if you're human, you would say, of course I'm human. I mean, is there anyone here who's not human? They did find that there was apparently a secret file of UFOs recently, I don't know. <laughs> if I asked you then, if you're human, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? Now you would probably look at me and think, right? That's not an easy answer. It's not a, it's like, what? What is it like to me? What, what does it mean, though, to be human? That's what I want to talk about today. What does it mean to be fully and completely human? A human fully alive, living up to the greatest of our potential. What does that mean? Well, only in context, you see, do we understand what it means to be human. Only in relation. We understand it. But I can't say being human is like, uh, I don't know, it's like being um, a bird. I mean, what does that mean? But the relation that we can, the context and relation that we can fully understand where it means to be human is to understand that we are creatures and we have a creator. And everything that we do, our very being, our existence, comes from Him. And every beat of our heart is a gift from Him. Every blink of our eye, every breath we take, every moment that we exist is pure gift from our Creator. What it means to be fully human is to explore the depths of what it means to be a creature of the Creator or a child of God. That's what it means to be completely human. And so... Like a child, we constantly reach out for our Father. Always. We're constantly seeking the One, the Greater, the Creator, our God, our Father, who made us. Because, you see, God made us in His own image. And so we seek the One in whose image we are made. And that takes different forms and different lives. What does it mean to seek God? Well, then we have to understand, well, who is God? Well, let me tell you, I spent six years uh, in formation and training and seminary classes and lots of great professors. And I still can't fully really answer that question because why? I can't fully really answer that question. Because I'm not God. But I can know certain things about God. And the more we know about God, you see, the more we recognize the yearning within ourselves to be one with Him, is the more we recognize ourselves, the more we know ourselves, the more fully human that we are, the more we understand why we're here. And what's our purpose? So we call this class the human search for God. That sounds kind of weird. I think I'm hearing myself talk. <laughs> the human search for God. <clears throat> Psalm 105. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Because rejoice because when we seek God. That is the ultimate, right? That is the purpose of our being. When we seek and come to know God, our Creator, that is why we're here. In every fiber of our being, everything within us that becomes so restless, so seeking, never satisfied, always looking for something more and more and more, all that's completely satisfied in Him. He only told us that 
satisfaction of that yearning for God is, of course, in heaven, right? But even on this earth, even on this earth, we can come to a peace that man cannot know, that the world can never give. When we finally feel the seeking, the yearning, the longing, the restlessness of our heart, with who our heart is made for, God. So what does it mean to be human? We go back to the beginning. And we look in the Bible, we look in the book of Genesis, the very beginning, the first book of the Bible. How did everything come to be? How did we come to be? In Genesis 1, 27, you see, God created mankind in his image. Male and female, he created them in his own image. And you see, so in, in that, it doesn't mean that we look like God, right? Because God is spirit. I mean, God didn't have my hairstyle. It'd be cool if he did. So this is a very good hairstyle. <laughs> what does it mean then if, we're, if I say that you and you and you are made in God's image? What does that mean? What does it mean that we have what other creatures do not have? A rational, living soul. And we have an intellect that we can think and a will, freedom. And that using our intellect and our will is what we use to seek and find the Creator. You see, your uh, St. Bernard at home doesn't know God. Can't. Doesn't have the ability to ration, rationalize that. But we were given that ability for one purpose. To know him from whom we came in his image. We have free will in his image. We are free to choose. In other words, we can choose to, to listen to our very being, our creation, our everything, and see God, or we can choose not to. We can choose to love God and not love God. We can choose to follow the commandments or to break the commandments. We can choose to be here in RCIA on a journey toward God, or we can choose not to be here. And God doesn't make us do anything. God doesn't make us love Him. Although He loves us more than we can ever describe in human terms. But He doesn't force us to love Him, because if He did, we're not robots, we're not automatons, or puppets on a string that God pulled. That's not how it works. Because if it did work like that, then it wouldn't be real. It wouldn't be meaningful. It wouldn't mean anything if we are told to do something and we have no other choice. But the free will is our greatest gift, right? That's the greatest gift back to God when we use a free will to seek and know and love Him and follow Him as a free act. As God gives us the gift of himself, we return that gift of ourselves to him. And in that exchange, you see, that exchange of love, that's where we find the greatest definition of the beginning of the question. What does it mean to be human? In Genesis 2, 7, he goes on to say that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And that is that he ensouled us. The very breath of life. The very breath of life. The soul. See, the soul is a rational part of us. It's who we are. It's our greatest identity. Soul and body are one. It's not, it's not like a machine in the body and a ghost inside of us who's the soul. The soul and body work united or one. And it's who we actually are, the deepest part of ourselves, our identity. And then that soul also is the ability to think. That's the image of God, right? And the soul, our ability to know, to think, to use reason, to understand. So we are naturally meant to be with God in Genesis 3 where things get a little bit haywire with Adam and Eve and we'll go over that in another class coming up. But what happened when we hear that they heard the 
sound of the Lord God walking about in the garden at the breathing time of the day. That garden of Eden was perfection. It was, it was called original justice. There was no pain, no suffering. There was no death. God and man were together as we are meant to be. And that's our natural state as a human being. That's our natural state. Is to walk with God as with the Father. The one who knows us better than we know ourselves. That's the original way we were created to be in the beginning. But what happened? Well, Adam and Eve committed the, the great sin. Right? The original, the original sin. We'll talk about that again in another class. But when they did that, they rebelled against God. They wanted to be like God without God. Hubris, pride, all those things came to be sin. And in doing so, they broke that close bond and they were cast out. And as a result of that, death and sin and everything comes to the world. Darkness falls. And the first thing you hear after they commit the great sin, the rebellion against God, is he's going through the garden. And we're here, they seek him, right? But there, in that moment, when they separated themselves from God, they hide from him. The first symptom of the disease of sin is that we separate ourselves from God. And then they hid from each other. Remember, they covered themselves. And so the second symptom of sin is to be separated from one another. And that's the state of a lot of you think of it, right? In our, in our, in our world, in our culture, Maybe in our own lives at one time or another. But is that is that the way it's meant to be? Is that being fully human? St. Augustine, my favorite saint, his feast day was a couple days ago, wrote a book called The Confessions. It's his confession of his faith, but also his, his routes to get there to his oneness with God, giving himself over to God completely from where he started, which was very, very not saintly. I'll keep it clean. Very, very not saintly. And he rationalized this. He understands, looking at his own journey of faith toward God, the same journey that we're all together today, really. His human journey toward God. And he says this. He says, you are great, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power, and your wisdom is without measure. And God is everything. Everything. You encourage us to delight in your praise, for you have made us for yourself. And our heart is restless until it rests in you. Think about that. You have made us for yourself. And our heart is restless until it rests in you. In other words, we were born, you see, with a God-shaped hole in our heart, in our soul, in our very being. And nothing can fill that hole except for God. Now we try to fill that hole with all kinds of things, right? We're restless, we're seeking, we want more, we we think we can make more money. We think we can do more sin. We think we can get bigger houses. But in the end, when we achieve those things, are we completely satisfied and at peace? No, we're not. Ever. And so what do we do? I gotta find more. I gotta buy more. You wanna you ever wonder why the, the really, really like super wealthy people in the world do crazy things like go into space and go into water and submarines to the Titanic or whatever kind of crazy exotic thing. Do you know why? Because they haven't found peace. They have to do more. Our heart is restless. You see. Maybe you can experience that in your own life. Restlessness. Never being satisfied. 
knowing there is something more, but we just don't know what it is, and we keep trying to find it. In the end, we become the same thing. Ask us again. It's because there's only one thing. There's only one thing that brings peace. Only one thing that finds contentment and fulfillment. Only one way to achieve the goal of humanity. God. There is no substitute. So, in N.K. Chesterton, a great Catholic writer, uh, he wrote this, and you may think this is odd. He said, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is seeking God. You think, well, that doesn't make sense. That seems to be not the same thing. But think about what he's saying. Whenever we try for more, we go for sin. We try to fill that restlessness. So we go for sin. It doesn't work. But what are we really seeking? We're seeking God. We're looking at the wrong places. Looking at the wrong places. But the good thing, the good news is, is that God doesn't hide himself from us. It's not like a puzzle we have to solve. It's not like a maze where we have to find where is God. He wants us to find him. He curses himself out for us. So to be human is to search for God. That's really what it is. That's what defines us in our very core, our very being. Your compendium, which is in your uh, folder that you have today, if you can read along if you like. Number two, the number on there refers to the paragraph number, not the page number. So you'll notice in your compendium that each uh, page has a num number of the paragraphs on there, the paragraph is numbered. So this is number two of the compendium. Why does man have a desire for God? God himself in creating man in his own image has written upon his heart the desire to see him. Even if this desire is often ignored, God never ceases to draw man to himself because only in God will he find and live the fullness of truth and happiness for which he never stops searching. By nature and by vocation, therefore, man is a religious being capable of entering into communion with God. This intimate and vital bond of God confers on man his fundamental dignity. And so what is that saying? Well, do we ever ignore that yearning for God in us? Yeah, I'm sure we do. And the good thing is, though, that God is constantly here. He is constantly here. One of the saints called God the hound of heaven. Because he constantly chases after us, right? Offering himself, never forcing himself, never making us do anything, but he's always there, lifting, reaching out his hand. And we go around, and he comes over here. We go around here, he comes over here, right? I'm here, I'm here, right here, look at me. I am what you see. Even though we ignore him, we sin, we do different things, God has never, he didn't just give up on us, he didn't walk away. He gave us his own son to bring us closer to him. of heaven never stops seeking us. It is we who stop seeking him. And at our core, we are religious beings. In other words, we know we have a soul, naturally. And that soul yearns for God to worship him, to love him, to be with him forever. I'm going to play this for you. I, I like these little things called a three-minute catechism. And I'm not going to play all the videos today because of time, but there are a couple that are really good. This takes the catechism or the teaching of the Catholic Church and kind of boils it down to a plain little film, but I found it to be very informative. So I want to talk about this one real quick. Let's watch this one real quick on the 
nature of man. What is man? When I say man, I don't mean male. I mean human. Never mind, I'm moving on. Can you hear it? It was a great film, though. I'll show it to you. All. <laughs> so, what is religion? Well, if God seeks us and gives us everything, He made us for Himself, then religion is man's response to God. Man's response to God's offering of Himself. It's a response of love. God, who is love, right? So, who is God? God is love. That doesn't mean that God loves, like he, he loves people. That's an attribute of God, right? No. God is love itself. And so every experience of love is an experience of God. God is love. God is truth. God doesn't just tell the truth. He is truth itself. So when we seek truth, we see God. When we experience truth, we come to know God. Even back, kind of weird again. Even back in ancient times, pagan philosophers, you've heard of them, right? Plato, Aristotle, and so forth, by reason alone, understood that God exists. They had not been, God had not been revealed to them. But they understood, you see, because by our reason, when we were given as being made in God's image, our intellect and our will, and by nature, God's creation around us, we can come to know that God exists. And we cannot come to know God. God has to reveal himself to us for us to know him, right? But we can know that God exists, and we can know attributes of God. And so Plato... Well, I'll skip play, but it gets a little complicated. <laughs> Let me go over to Aristotle. Aristotle says that life and living and being is movement. He, he, so he says, okay, you're going to take like an equation. And we're going to call life movement. That life moves, right? It's movement. And you reason back. Reason back there. There has to be someone who began the movement. Right? You know those old things on the desk, I don't know what they're called, but they're like old school school stuff. The little ball that hang from strings and you do like this and starts and momentum, I mean, keeps moving it. Right? Well, consider that to be life, existence, movement. But they don't move on their own. Someone has to begin the movement who isn't dependent upon that movement. He is more than the movement. Because he began it. And so what Plato called this was the unmoved mover. The one who does not need to be moved, who is the source of all movement, alive. And what did Plato ration back to? I mean, I'm sorry, Aristotle. Plato a little complicated. We're going to skip into that. He's cool, but take it on this. Ration back to God. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas posited the five proofs for the existence of God using Aristotle, Aristotle's philosophy. And what he's saying is to be an atheist or someone who denies the existence of God is irrational and illogical because we can know at least that God exists. Through nature, through ourselves, our mind, who we are, through the understanding of life. I'm going to skip through this. <coughs> so man can know God exists by reason alone through nature. Romans 1 20, ever since the creation of the world, he is invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood 
and perceive in what he has made. I mean, can we not look at the beauty of creation and understand that there is a creator that's not random? Can we look at the perfection of the, of the planet and that how anything out of balance and we would all spin off and die a horrible, fiery death and everything would be gone? And it's so exact. How about the human body? Have you ever really studied anatomy and physiology and how the human body actually works? And it's to perfection. One little thing off and it wouldn't exist the way it would work. It's not random. We can understand that the cosmos and everything that was created and the way things flow and work together is intelligent. It's not random. We can look at a sunset on a beautiful evening. You ever done that? You ever, has, it, has anything in nature ever caught you where you just kind of, your heart felt full? You felt elated? Have you ever seen anything like that in nature that made you feel good? If you haven't, go do it. It's great. I have. And that's because even our subconscious, we are recognizing the hand of our Creator. Because God isn't just beautiful. God is just creating you. God is beautiful itself. Reason, however, is limited, right? We are not all powerful beings. Our reason has limits. And so, we can, like Aristotle, can come to reason back that there is a creator, there is God. God does exist. But we cannot know about him. Right? And how can we? We can know his attributes. We can't know God unless what happens? He reveals himself to us. We call that Revelation. Revelation. It's not the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Revelation is everything in the Bible. All of it. It means that God reveals himself to us. And that's how we come to know truly who he is. It begins by the, the human search, the, the yearning for God. We reason through nature and intellect that God exists. And then we come to know God personally because he wants us to know him personally. And he shows himself to us. Because we can't reason that. And God must reveal it to us. Let's give it that. So the human search for God is reason. The religious search for God is through revelation. As God reveals himself more and more to us. We seek to know him better. I'm going to skip that. God, I skip things, sorry. Guys. I already said it most of that. I get ahead of myself a lot. Do what you do. So how did God reveal himself? Gradually, right? If you look in the Old Testament which is really a book of, of God revealing himself to his people gradually after the fall of Adam and Eve and, and being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, sin and death fall in the world. But did God give up on us? No, right? You then you say, that's enough. These people are horrible. I'm leaving. But now even from the very first, from the very beginning, God, it's called the first gospel in, in the book of Revelation. I mean, uh, Genesis chapter 3. But God says, to the servant, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her. That enmity is the son. Enmity is a divining wall of the The first gospel. Right when we sin, he loves us so much immediately, he says, I'm going to send my son to fix this. And then that begins, right? The road back to God, the road back to communion with God begins. And we see that in Adam, right? We've talked about that. And then Noah, what happens in Noah? Well, the earth becomes 
uh, completely, um, I don't know, bad. And everyone doing bad things. And so God sent the flood. The you know, creation wiped out. But Noah, of course, is saved because he listened to God and built the ark. What happened at the end is the important part, right? Because what happened at the very end of that journey? The flood and the sea did. God makes a covenant with God. Covenant is a sacred promise. He says, I will make of you and your offspring a great nation. My people. And the sign of the covenant is the rainbow. God put down his bow. And there was peace. And through Noah and his family and his offspring, the human community was again begins again that journey for him. And Abraham. Abraham was a simple farmer, you know, a then he encounters God. And God says, I choose you, right? Of course, we know that Abraham demonstrated his faith. And Isaac, you know, he didn't. He was willing to sacrifice his son for God. And in that faith, he says, I will make of you a great nation again, which will be as many as the sands on the seashore and the stars in the sky. So God begins to form his people for more. Right, so you see a family in Noah. He begins to form a people in Abraham. And then comes Moses. Moses. And of course we know the story of Moses in the book of Exodus. And Moses, when he said, you go and free my people from slavery in Egypt, and he does, and the plagues and all the things, and then they get freed from Egypt. He makes a covenant with Moses. The covenant of Sinai, Mount Sinai. From which came what? Not only this, but this is a big, I mean, you've seen the, the TV shows, you know, the, the Ten Commandments. There are more that came from that. And Moses was designated to lead a people to form them and lead them to God. And so in Moses, in what we call the Mosaic Covenant with God, God takes us and forms us into a nation, a nation with an identity as his people and a religion. The purpose of our being. To know, love, and serve God is the only way to fulfill our needs. Then we had David, the great king, right? He tells David, he says, from you, David, from you, David, will come the Messiah. From your line will come the Messiah. And David, everything he could to screw that up. Right? He was a bit like St. Augustine, free, holy. But we can't mess it up when God willed it. And so David needed to cooperate with God. God David, David also had a great faith, a deep faith. Psalm 51 is a great thing to read when you have time. That is David sorrow to God for his sins. Deep faith. And from David would come the Messiah be his own son. And his son, little by little, through the covenants and the relationship with God, God reveals himself more and more and more to his people, to us, of who he is and who we are in relation to him. And then finally, God reveals himself fully and completely in Jesus Christ, his son. He is the Word of God. He is the Word which is spoken into eternity. He is the final Word. The fullness of God revealed. And he reveals himself most clearly right there behind you. Oh, my heart is there. Oh, there it is. On the cross. 
That is the love of God, who is love. John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh. The Word who was, who is God, who was with God from the very beginning, through whom all things were made, all creation came to be, that Word who is God became flesh. We call that the incarnation. Right? The becoming of flesh. Do you understand what that really means? The incarnation is everything. That God became man. He didn't just put on a man's suit. He became man. He became as weak as we are in his humanity. He became as, as vulnerable to suffering and death as we are. And the very act of doing that is like a man coming, a, a human being coming down to the, uh, you know, an amoeba and saying, I love you, but I want to become an amoeba. And that's not even close to, to an anal analogy of what that really means, that God became man. Out of absolute love. And in doing that, again, he reveals who he is. That God is love. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the actual translation in the original point in Greek translates more directly to and pitched his tent among us. Think about that imagery. Pitched his tent among us. He didn't just come by and visit. You see the politicians do that, right? Like, it's like a big disaster or something's going on. And they come by with the camera and they, they take some boxes and they smile. And the camera's leaving them. They're not in. That's not being in, right? Now, Jesus is the hardest working one on the line. He is one of us. He pitches his tent. He is one among us. God became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. And later Jesus would say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what do these things tell us about God? As we search for God, the human beings search for God, search for the fullness of God, and the fullness of our own meaning and our being, and why we're here and where we're going, what does it tell us? It tells us that there, there aren't many ways to God. There are not. There aren't many truths. There is one. And the only way is Jesus. You ever seen those things? See, you see my bumper here, what I call coexist. You seen those? And on coexist has like the different symbol of different religions. Yeah. You know, and the T was the, the cross. And what I'm saying is, 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 is very wrong. But they're all the same. Buddha. Muhammad, Jesus, nothing different. But there is. Jesus told us so. God revealed that to us. I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father. No one fulfills their, the ultimate destiny of our human journey. We can call heaven except for him. And him alone. That is the truth. He is truth. That can mean nothing else. To whom shall we go? That's what Peter asked Jesus in John chapter 6. After he revealed himself, uh, a lot of about the, what we call the Eucharist, we'll talk about that later. And everybody left him, they were angry, they didn't understand what he's saying. Everybody left except for the twelve apostles. And he says to the apostles, do you want to go too? And Peter speaks the words of faith. He said, to whom shall we go? I mean, there's nothing else. You are it. You are everything. 
To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Eternal life is that. Another way of describing the fulfillment of all human desire. You. So there is only one truth. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that a thing cannot be true and not true at the same time in the same way in the same place. In other words, if I tell you that this, this is a pink striped polka dotted elephant named Harold. Right here, here's Harold. This is what I identify this object as a pink striped, whatever I say. My elephant, Harold. Have you met Harold? Yes. Can, can you pet him? He's, oh, good. Harold likes that. Now, that is my truth. That's what I believe. Is that okay? Oh, we come from that society that says, oh, you cannot question someone else's, what they think, right? Well, that's not true. That's just, that's called stupid. <laughs> No, it's not true, because what is the truth? It's a pin. Can it be anything else but a pin? No, it's a pin. It will never be any other than a pin. It began as a pin, it will end as a pin. It will always be a pin. It will never be a pink, polka dotted, striped elephant named Harold. What if I really believe it? What if I get offended because you say, this is not Harold? Does that change the truth? No, and that's what truth is, you see. Truth is singular. Truth cannot be anything else other than what it is. There is only one truth. There are not many truths about the same thing. Otherwise, it wouldn't be truth. It defies the definition. Truth, then, is objective, not subjective. In other words, truth doesn't bend to my will. It just is. Objective. This is objectively a pin. Truth is not subjective, whatever I want it to be, whatever I think it is. Herod. That's not true. What is true if I say to you this is Herod, is you should get me help immediately. If something's wrong. Truth is singular. It cannot change. But there is only one truth. And the diversity of religions cannot be true. There is one God, one Savior, one Christ, not many. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we cannot get to God through Buddha. We cannot get to God through Muhammad. We cannot get to God through whoever. Only Jesus. The diversity of religions cannot be true. Because truth cannot oppose itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Tell me that I don't make sense. Usually my wife will tell me when I don't make sense. But I, I encourage you to tell me also when I don't make sense. Christ himself establish a religion. It is the organic development from Judaism which is fulfilled in Christ. And he established a religion we call Christianity. Christianity is not an idea. It's not a philosophy. Christianity ultimately is a person. You see, we have a personal God. That person is Jesus Christ. That is Christianity. So within Christianity, then, many versions of the one truth is around, right? Well, some say this is right. Some say all oh, the same thing. Some say that is right. Well, then a hundred people say a hundred different things. 
on the same subject. Some say this is Harold. Some say this is Fred. Some say this is Barbara. Some say this is, a, is whatever. Is that true? I mean, how do we know? Where's the truth? Because the truth cannot be multiple things on you one day. So if I would say, well, let me tell you this. Let me say this. You know what denominations are, right, within Christianity? There are different sets of Christianity who disagree with each other. Right? Fundamentally, that's what it means. Do not agree on fundamental truths. You know how many there are in the United States alone? Who wants to take a guess? How many Christian denominations are there in the United States alone? You can't guess. <laughs> Never take a guess. Take a stab. 5,000. 5, 100. Anyone go to a different number? 25. 25. Anyone, you would think there are more than 5,000? Anyone at all? 33,000. 33,000. That number is old, by the way. How does that happen? Because we break off, break off, break off, break off, break off, break off, break off. No one agrees. They might say, well, the Holy Spirit leads people in different ways, but the Holy Spirit cannot lead us away from the truth. Then it wouldn't be gone. Now, we call denominationalism in the Catholic Church to be the splitting off of Christians into opposing sects that are uh, disagreeable with each other. I mean, I don't think it's really a war, but I mean, we don't agree on fundamental truths of the faith. Is that what God wills? Well, no, he, he, said, he said differently, right? John 17 and 20, Jesus' great priestly prayer. He says, I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me through their words. Like the apostles, right? Who believe in me through their words, so that they may all be one. They may all be one. As you, Father, and me, and I, and you, they may also be in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. How are we to be one? As the Father and the Son are one. They are one God. We are to be one people. The body of Christ. One. Something to think about as we go forward. One. 33,000. Not the same thing. Ultimately, the search for God is the search for truth. We seek the truth naturally. It is our instinct to seek the truth and to tell the truth. And hopefully we want to know what is God's will? Where is God leading? Did, God, did Jesus establish a hundred churches or one? What is his will? What is the truth? I need to know. I'm assuming that's why everyone is here because we want to know. Proposed to you as we go forward, and of course we'll talk about this a lot later on. But Christ did establish by his own hands a church. On the rock of St. Peter. Matthew 16, 18 through 19, which was by the way the gospel reading, part of the gospel reading that this past Sunday. And so I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. Petros in Greek, rock. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of the nether world shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Where did he give Peter a singular authority, which he also gave to the apostles of the whole together, but then Peter by himself. And upon this rock I will build my church. And we 
call the church today Catholic. Catholic is not a denomination. We don't believe in denominations. We believe in the one. We yearn for the oneness of Christianity again, altogether. Catholic was first used in the second century as an adjective to describe that church. Catholic means universal. Universal. The one church. Open to all. Universal. I've already talked about theology and truth. I told you I get ahead of myself. Now, let's talk about relativism. <coughs> relativism is a belief that there is no absolute truth. It doesn't exist. Right? So, nothing can be absolutely true at all times. It changes with us. Right? You ever heard of I'm going to tell you my truth. You ever heard that phrase? It's pretty popular now. Did you see it? You hear it? I always wonder when I hear that. I always go, well, I don't thank you, but I want to know the truth. <laughs> Not your truth. I want to know the truth. Well, it doesn't mean that, well, what's true for me is not true for you. In other words, for you, this is a hymn, but for me, it's, it's what I call it? Harold, thank you. It's Harold, my, my multicolored elephant. And that's okay, right? Because you can both have that, and that's okay. It's, that's the same thing. Relativism. Because I feel, I feel that this is Harold, so it must be true. We're not wrong with that, is it? Is it true? Is this Harold? I feel it's Harold. Is it Harold? Can anyone tell me that, it's, that it is Harold or is not Harold? But you insult me when you say that. <laughs> I'm offended. Does it still change the fact? I feel differently when you say that about this truth. I feel more that this is definitely Harold. Does it change the truth? Neither does our feelings. Right? They don't. Because there's one truth. You can't be anything else. The old vision says it can be anything. It can be Harold. This can be Penelope. This can be um, a giant tank made by General Sherman in World War II. That's relativism. Does that make sense? I hope not. <laughs> you hear it right? Just because something I feel to me is right for me. No, it either is right or wrong. <coughs> right? I mean, we're talking about big things. Not like what temperature we put for the air conditioner, which I everyone know the eternal truth is that 69 degrees in the day is lower at night. <laughs> yes. Whether or not beings belong to which they always do, the eternal truth of your heritage is the same different. And those are eternal truths. <laughs> we're talking about big things, right? Things that matter. Truth. Can't be different. Don't put your beliefs on me. Everybody needs to find their own truth about God. Well, Right, I, I agree, don't push beliefs on anyone, right? That's, God doesn't force himself on people. That's not what we should do. But, I disagree with the second part. There isn't your own truth about God. There is one truth about God. In other words, truth doesn't bend to our will. We bend to the truth. Otherwise, we're living a lie, fantasy. We're not living in reality. There are two arguments against relativism. It's self-contradictory. contradicts itself. And it's unworkable and primary. In other words, look at this. If nothing is true, that's the premise, right? Nothing is true. This is just simple, simple logic. Nothing is true. If nothing is true, then the statement nothing is true must be false. Therefore, it is false and nothing is true. So, what relativism presents is a circular argument. Because it can't win that argument because it's not true. It falls on its, on its own merits. We apply simple logic or reason. Pope well, Benedict XVI actually spoke, preached, and wrote quite a bit on relativism, and he sees it, saw it as the 
Um, one of the major philosophical religious battles of our modern era in the world. He said we live under a dictatorship of relativism. And what he meant by that was that we're forced, you know, no, this is Harold. How dare you say otherwise? You will be ostracized in everything else because you do not say this is Harold. Even though you know. Instead of everyone else, really. This is not Harold. This is a pen. Relativism is, the relativism we call ontological relativism, and that's just the, what I talked about that says that nothing is really true. It's whatever you believe, right? That leads all the way to the second thing, right? One poison leads to a worse poison. So that poison leads us to what we call moral relativism. And that explodes bad things. So what is good is dependent upon the eye of the beholder. To kill, to murder, well, what if I believe that I should do that? If, we get, if we're relative, right, we have a relativistic understanding of everything of the, of the world, then we can't rely on anything to say it's not, you can't do that. Because it's true for me, so it must be okay. How do we know that murdering is wrong? Because God told us? Well, but before that, how do we know? Because we're human and we know. Because maybe God then we know that to murder is wrong. That gets into a whole host of things, right? To use something other than what it's created to be used for. That gets into things of a sensitive nature. We'll talk about way later toward the end. When does life begin and end? Who has authority over that? What's the truth? God is true. Psalm 119, the sum of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous ordinances endures forever. Righteous words mean his, the law of God. The law of God. St. Thomas Aquinas said this about truth, the acknowledgement of understanding who say it, this is really one truth. The death nature of truth leads the human mind inevitably to the ultimate question, what is the truth? What is the ultimate meaning of all things? This perennial quest for meaning by humanity is characterized by the search for the ultimate truth, a reality that everyone calls God. And so in the end, the search for God, the search for our meaning, the search for the fulfillment of our very being, in the search for truth. But truth is not an idea. Ultimately, truth is a person that we call God. Pontius Pilate said to Jesus, and Jesus spoke about the truth. Pontius Pilate speaks for relativism or the culture that we live in really today. What is truth? He said, what is truth? Yeah. What's good for you? Yeah, it's not the same for me. But is that itself true? You have to say that. You have to say So the search for truth is what you're doing right now. What we're going to do together. You're here on a journey for a reason, whatever it is. Everybody has their different ones. Hopefully you're here to search for the truth. We're going to do our best to communicate that to you. But you know he's going to communicate to you the best. We'll communicate that to you the best. The one whom we seek. So I would like you, if we go through this and we think about this is the foundation of what we're going to learn, we're going to talk about. This is the foundational understanding of things. It's to remember that we're searching for seeking for truth, but the ultimate truth cannot 
speak of days in my mouth up through God alone. And these are nine words from the deepest part of our heart, the soul, which is made in his image. I hope that you came here with a yearning for God, a restlessness within you. And I pray that you will find the fulfillment of that restlessness, the God-shaped hole in all of our hearts in this place. God and soul. I've said all that. I'm good. That's good enough. Any questions? <laughs> No questions at all? Okay, either you're a very shy group, and I will get you out of that, or I was such a magnificent teacher that I have answered all your questions ever there could possibly be. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. No denomination of being Christianity. Okay. So, yet, if God's truth, okay, how do these people, how do we have so many different beliefs? Oh, well, we have free will. We have free will. And everybody has some of the truth, obviously, you know. No one has a corner on it, like no one has anything else. But we see the fullness of truth. The ultimate truth, right? Not half the truth or three quarters of the truth or 98.3% of the truth, but 100%. That's all we'll settle for, right? Otherwise, we'll still be restless. So we have free will. We, we actually have that free will. And that's our, that's in both our great uh, um, dignity and also our greatest I will not fall. Our greatest stumbling block as well. Because we can choose. Yes. Well, I mean, we say, right, so when you say religion, I'm thinking world religion, right? So no, then when we go back to, when you're talking about Judaism, for example, Judaism, right? But is. Catholic, which means, again, that's, that's not a nomination, it's a descriptor of the church. It goes back to 33 AD. Right there where we just looked at, you know, I'll build my church upon your block. What was before that? Judaism. Right. Genesis, the Old Testament. And that's what Jesus was, right? Jesus tell me that. Jesus was a Jew, right? Yes. Yep. And so you see Christianity, and I'm going to talk about this quite a bit, actually, we talk about the origins of worship, you know, or how we got to worship, how we do. Uh, I'll talk about this a lot, but just to say this, Christianity is, we are, in a sense, Jewish, in that Christianity is the organic completion evolution of Judaism and through Christ. That's the organic as we evolve into Christianity. It is the same thing. It's not different. It's not two different religions, really. It's an organic development. And the ultimate development was the catalyst was Jesus. He fulfilled Judaism. And so would that be similar to the Acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. So, 
lot of Jewish people did, so those people that became Christian. They, they are Christian. It's a religion, uh, but um, I mean, we see it in secular circles called Judeo-Christian. You hear the term Judeo-Christian values, Judeo-Christian philosophy. It's because it's all one, it's why you know it's all here. You know, it's not two separate folks, but one, the old and the new, and it's all about Jesus. You see, this we call the Bible. I can put. Jesus on the front of it was described because everything from the, from the first word of Genesis to the last word of Revelation is all about Jesus Christ. Every bit of it. Every single bit of it. And he is the organic fulfillment of Judaism, Christianity, which is simply following the Messiah, the Christ. Good question. Doesn't make me think. I like that. Anything else? All right, guys, uh, let's end with a quick prayer. I'll see you here next Wednesday at 6 p.m. And we will be talking about creation, fall, and grace, which will not be me. It will be someone else with a collar on their neck, I'm sure. That is not me. Uh, and they will be here to teach you about that. And as you see, the, the, the understanding of how we're doing this is from the, from the wide to the narrow, right? This is the philosophy of how we understand the world and ourselves as human. And now we're going to talk about who we are in the physical sense, in the metaphorical, I mean, sorry, the metaphysical sense, in the spiritual sense, all of it together in creation. And what happened in the fall? And what is grace? The greatest gift. What does it mean? You hear it said all the time. What does grace actually mean? What is it? That's next week. God bless you. See you next week. Thanks.